now, ladies and gentlemen, we are discussing with the donors and some others about how we can how we can be more effective in aid, actually. But first, I would like to present our new panel. Next to me, welcome, Charlotte Pietra Gornitska, Director General of SIDA. And besides her, Tove Dengboll, Head of Technical Advisory Services at Danida, the Danish aid. And then we have Mr. Roman Morenzi, who we met earlier today, the Executive Director of the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World in Trieste, Italy. But born in Rwanda, raised in Burundi, and he has, among things, served as a Minister for Science and Technology in Rwanda. And besides him, we have Finn Tarp, Director, UNU Wider. Um, Charlotte, first, uh, we heard a lot about what we know about aid effectiveness and what we still don't do when it comes to aid. How do you, what's your reaction on that? Uh, well, I think what, uh, what you've heard this morning is that there are some uh, words that we keep repeat. Uh, we know that we need to be work more systemically, we know that we need to coordinate better, we know that capacity building is important, that projects are less effective than programs, and all of that. But we so why don't you do it? You know what? <laughs> uh, that's, that's the million dollar question. No, it's not. I, I think uh, what is important for donors is to uh, decide where the identity of a donor. I think for SIDA, we, we were tasked in 2010 to focus a lot on, on financial management, really put the money into efficient aid. And how do you do that without knowing what works? So it's time to prove to ourselves that we care about that. So first of all, we need to use research more than we do. Uh, we may not need to hear the same things from research, but we, we just have to start to use them. Well, how do we do that then? If we know that um, a partner or a recipient country has uh, a plan, a health plan, we need to be able to, to contribute to that plan. Uh, and there are things that we have to consider there. Do we c sit around a table agreeing on who's doing what to that plan wide open, or do we gather around a table saying, we know that uh, sexual reproduct reproductive health is a Swedish expertise, field of expertise. Is, if that's wanted in, in, in a collaboration, we can, we can deliver that. If that's not wanted, well, a good donor should probably say, well, we might step back if there are other donors who want to be there. But what about putting, we, we, we talked a little bit about putting the bottles in the pool, rather. Uh, I mean, okay, yeah, I explained to yeah. you. Like all the donors say, okay, you need help. Yeah. We got the money. Yeah. We put the money in a basket or yeah. in a... And then, then they do something about it together, rather than saying we have the expertise and we yeah, want to help. Yeah, and that's the, other, that's the other alternative. Yeah. But the thing is that, uh, there I mean, there is this reality that... A donor being an agency based on tax money, not mm -hmm. voluntary money, has to be able to say, we contribute uh, in, a in a certain way that can be scrutinized and we need to be held accountable because we're an agency. That is not necessarily the case with, vol case with voluntary money. But I think there is a way to do that because if we start to be, if we start to plan together and be very clear that this is the pool, this is what's going to be achieved, this is the part of the pool uh, that we are contributing to. So we monitor, evaluate, we research, we communicate around that. I do think we can get the taxpayer on board, but we're far away from that today, we, uh, in communication as well. So, so there is this kind of shift now where we need to be able to to accept the fact that we n need to agree that we all need achievements in what we're doing and we need to be able to say this is what is supposed to be achieved and we also need to be brave enough to communicate whether we are successful or not around the achievements but if we 
if we just say we're there to contribute for the sake of contributing, we, we, we won't have the trust uh, from, from people that we are accountable to, both in country where we work and in our own home country. So it's a balancing act. But it always depends on what you mean by results. I yes, mean, it does. And that's also a communication mm. task, you say. Mm. For example, many here said that sustainability can take more than four years, yes. more than eight years to develop. So you need a lot of patience from, from the public, from the general. So we need to influence the way we are being governed. We need governments to hold agencies to account on a more long-term planning cycle. We need to communicate with the people we work with in much more based on facts and research and regularly. And are you doing all this? No, we're not. But and you're the, the leaders, general director. Uh, well, uh, we are start, well, of course we are doing it, <laughs> but we're not, we, are not, we so haven't who's reached the result yet. No, okay. but we are we're working very hard. And sometimes I actually think that as donors, uh, it, we have a lot of different kinds of donors and mm -hmm. many donors have to fundraise. So how do they communicate? Mm. Well, not with what you just said. Nice pictures of happy children or very or crying children. We communicate in very tangible ways that are actually not helping out. And media is very, very into that as well. So we, we, have, we have to work hard to do this, to make it sexy enough. And that's what we're... Yeah, it's we a just, real challenge. It is. But it's our work, so... Yes, uh, Tove Dengbol from Danida. Your reflections, you've been here all day and I've mm. seen you writing a mm. lot during the day. I've enjoyed the discussions a lot, uh, both the presentations by the panel and, and uh, the questions raised by the audience. Um, and as Charlotte said, some of, of, of the key points we may have been aware of already, but it's very good to be reminded. It's, it's important to be reminded when, when we sign declarations about the ownership and then in practice for, forget about it and bring in our own ideas. Um, so, so the fact that RECOM is documenting consequences when we do not follow what we actually know is good practice to uh, start take the point of departure in, in what uh, the countries want themselves um, and the priorities they, they have, but, but then bring in our own ideas. So, so actually, I think that much of what RECOM is, is, is doing is, in fact, to remind us about things that we may have heard before, but which we tend, tend to, uh, to overlook for, for, for various reasons. One thing that you could remind us more about, in fact, and Charlotte just mentioned it, is that aid is just one among several sources of financing. Uh, and it's quite important, I think, to, to consider support to health and education also in that context, that there are various other uh, sources. First of all, the government's own investments, their foreign direct investments, remittances, and so on. Uh, and, and when we discuss uh, what works in, in AIDS, it's quite important that we consider aid catalytic, that aid can do something in terms of supporting uh, institutional uh, reforms and processes and capacity building and so on, which foreign direct investments, for instance, wouldn't do. But, but there are some limitations also to what aid can do. And, and, and I think this, this is an important uh, uh, thing to keep in mind when, when presenting both findings in, in this area, but also in the other areas that, that uh, RECOM is covering. Then I think that you, you put a very clear um, point to, uh, to, to the, the problem of donor fashions that we tend to, uh, to uh, entering and leave the same areas at the same time. Uh, it seems that we have now all agreed that water and sanitation is no longer a problem. Um, and it's much more interesting to discuss uh, conflict and fragility and resilience and, <laughs> and climate change and, and other issues. Uh, and, and it is quite important to be reminded by the clear figures that we have, that, yeah. that we have a very uh, long way to go and 750 million people still miss water and sanitation. Um, and, and that may be a particularly a bilateral donors problem that, that uh, we shift uh, emphasis according to political uh, directions also. And, and some suggested that maybe multilateral assistance uh, is the answer to at least some of this. Um, our government has actually taken the consequence of, of this point of view in, in terms of uh, for, for social sector development. And in our recent strategy from, from May last year, um, it said that we will mainly support health and education, water sanitation through uh, multilateral arrangements. 
Uh, we are with CEDA in the Global Partnership for Education, uh, and we're gradually phasing out our bilateral support to education in order to increase uh, what we're doing in, in Global Partnership for Education, as an example. Uh, that, that's, that's actually a reflection of this thinking that maybe we can do more uh, together if, if we do it multilaterally. There will be other areas where bilateral aid uh, is definitely uh, important to maintain, and this is also what we do. Sorry. Then uh, we've discussed uh, modalities a lot. Uh, is, is sector budget support better than project aid or, or, or how to go about it? And there I think that the key message which also came from, from the, the presentations we've got is that it's the sector-wide approaches which are important. It's important that we, we have a, take the point of departure in an overall strategy or plan which is nationally owned and whether we then contribute to it with uh, projects or with sector budget support and so on. That, that depends on, on the context uh, which of these modalities is the most appropriate. But the important thing is that, that there is an overall framework, that we do not just pop in with whatever we think uh, should be supported. Um, you've given us some wake-up calls. I mentioned the water and sanitation. Another one that I'd like to mention is, is, is the uh, primary education support. We all think that this is really a key priority that we all now uh, support uh, basic education mainly. And then you show us figures that uh, tertiary education is way above yeah. what we support uh, uh, to our support to, to primary but and also secondary, etc. So, so there's a lot of, of messages that come out of this which are really important and I think which it'll be difficult to overlook. The better you manage to synthesize it and, and come out with clear recommendations, messages, uh, the, the more difficult it'll be next time we need to make decisions just to disregard that, that actually we're doing something completely different from, from what is needed. But do you agree on what Charlotte just said about uh, the problems to explain and to get results that you can see? Mm. Is that also a part for Denmark when, when you talk about... Uh, you do you have the same problem as we have in Sweden? Of, of, of course we all have the pressure to provide uh, results. I think that, that we have, uh, during the past years, managed to, uh, to engage in a discussion with the general public where it's not just about Danita having produced these results, but where we have been trying to, to explain that we're contributing to results of the government, uh, that, that it is the government targets of uh, enrolling so and so many children in education. But has so that changed that the way you... you um you give for an A then? Have you, has it changed the way or have you just talked about it? Whether it's changed the way we're working? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it has changed the way we're working in, in the sense that we, we maintain uh, budget support, for instance. I know that, that this is now out of fashion in many countries, including Sweden. <laughs> but, uh, but our policy is that, that we maintain budget support and sector budget support also, where it's, of course, very difficult to attribute results to uh, a particular Danish support. But, but this, this has been accepted to at least some extent by the general public, uh, by the politicians. Uh, and, and, and that reflects a more nuanced, I think, uh, understanding of results as something that we're not the only one to produce, but that we produce jointly with the various partners, including not least the government partners. What do you think is needed to change the way donors are acting today? Because we've seen it's not the best way to act. Mm. No, other than information from you and you wider. And, and, and we are moving out of some of the areas where we've clearly seen today that we need to continue to support. So, so I don't think that we should praise ourselves for being uh, any different than, than, than other donors. Um, but, but I think that, that clear information about uh, what has worked and where there are deficiencies of funding and the, the negative consequences of some of the choices that we have, that, that is at least uh, an, an important step towards making a more reasonable, um, uh, making better decisions when, when we uh, need to make policy choices. Clear information, but you just said that you knew a lot of these things from before. And yeah, still but I also said we need to be reminded uh -huh, because reminded. it's so convenient to forget about it. <laughs> uh, yes. We know okay. country ownership, but we, we then need to be told what happens if, if we uh, disregard country ownership and just chip in with our various ideas. Then oh. maybe just one last comment to the researchers. I really appreciate the presentations today. I think Miguel's paper is excellent. Uh, the one where you're synthesizing the, the experience uh, so far from the literature. But it's quite important when you're communicating with us donors that you do not 
overly dwell on all the uh, methodological difficulties and, and where there's a lack of data and so on, because there's so much data already out there that could inform us uh, much better than, 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 than we've managed to be so far. So, so when you're communicating to us, it's, it's quite all right that it's relatively simple, clear messages. Of course, in your, your more academic papers, you need to have all the caveats and explain uh, the, the, the particular um, context and, and, and so on. But some of the messages, that the, the, the kind of messages that you gave us today, they're really very useful and easy to understand also for people like us when they come up in, in, in that clear form. Thank you. Roman, haven't been here all day. <laughs> Thank you. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> You know, when I was invited to come, I didn't know actually I was going to be contributing, but when I heard on the issue of budget support, I know what it did when I, for me at least, and, and for the country, uh, for me as a minister to be able to work, to do my work, and also uh, in Rwanda as a country uh, for um, achieving what I was asked in my, my portfolio. So I will say really that uh, a country needs ownership. So we, we are in a, a country you have to understand, a given government, that they are operating in an international setting, a global setting. So if you want to go out there, request that dollar amount, you need to deserve one or another to deserve that, that money. But as the Director General just said, this money comes from the taxpayers of these countries. So if you look at least in the speeches of President Kagame, he's been saying that, telling the Rwandans, that money comes from taxpayers. Mm -hmm. for us. So you need to know how to use that funding properly. So, so in the, the ownership comes with a policy. Do you have a policy in education? Or do you have a policy in health? Or do you have a policy in transport or in water? So normally these policies, you have not only the ownership of the government, but how did you come up with this policy? So you need to come up with a, a major consultation countrywide. At least that's what I did when I was there, countrywide. But that countrywide also, you need to be able to, to, to link with, with your international partners. You know, you can work with some consultant, the World Bank and, and U, U, UNESCO. They will have, help you to, to shape a policy not, that only corresponds to what you want, but that is realistic. And this policy also has to be aligned with international targets, because we are in an international setting. If you, you come and bring money to Rwanda, and then they want, or to Burundi, or whatever, to, to Ghana, and they want to use the money for some, some peculiar program, that will be a problem. So, so come with an international, international target in education, such as the Education for All, or the MDG. But I was probably lucky because I was appointed minister in 2001, and the Education for All and MDG were uh, formulated uh, in, in 2000. Yeah. So this means in formulating the Rwandan policy on education, the Rwandan policy on science, on higher education, I, I took care, I was really looking at the international target and also working with the donors. Actually, the, the, the lead donor was DFID at the time, and then we have other. And then, as the, one of the speakers said, when I arrived, I would have all these donors come to see me. Mm -hmm. Like, I would spend the whole day, the 260 days, three, three days, meeting these people. Then I realized, then I asked, is that a, a, a better way to deal with these people? Then they told me there is a, a beast called sector-wide approach. So I tried to go to, to, to Uganda. Uganda has already started that. Uh -huh. So I asked, I asked them to explain to me. And also, I wrote to, uh, to, to Ethiopia. So they, they gave me the orientation. Then I understood what, what, what it meant. And then in a year, I said, the best way to deal with these people is to put like, them like in a boss. These are development partners. You work with them. This is the civil society, and then, and then the government of Rwanda. And then we reached these targets that were very important. The education for all targets were the, mo the most important ones. And then from there, actually, by 2003, we what were they called the JRES, the Joint Review of the Education Sector of Rwanda. So, as I said, it was a one-year meeting, putting on the target. But during the year, we, we have working groups, working groups on, on, on teachers, on, on teachers, education, uh, teacher uh, um, quality, and then the, on, on construction and, and, and classrooms. So we, we had various, various groups, early childhood, 
So we have, a, and, and in each group, we will have a donor and the other, co the other community. And then a year later, we'll have all this meeting. I will sit really there, and then I will be asked question, did you reach the dropout rate? Did you reach the, the target? Did mm. you reach this, uh, the, the transition rate from primary to secondary? All these questions. And when actually I would go to the, to the cabinet, I was very so happy because I could say, we work all these people, this is the result. Mm. And during that day, I became, I was minister from one to six, and then continued to be, also I was uh, education and science, but I was almost science for, from one to nine. So, so during that period, I could see really a real rise in primary education enrollment and, and on the, the other targets, so, so which was very, very good. As I said, uh, DFID was the, the lead donor, so, but there are donors who said, I don't want to, to be involved in the management of the money, because the management of the money, then I could just leave it to DFID to follow up on that. So when we have this uh, basket funding, they will say, we rely on DFID, and then, of course, they will, they, they will have some report, but they will rely on DFID. DFID became the major follow-up person. Yeah. But in your case, it worked, uh, and also you had good leadership, and you, you knew what you wanted. But it sounded like a very long way, though, to get to achieve all this. If you could wish from the beginning, instead of all these people coming to you and sitting in your office asking you 260 days a year, what would you have liked it? Like what? What would you have liked it to be? In what way? What should the process be? The best process in order to fund? Actually, you see, the, the World Bank and UNESCO, mm -hmm. they, they understood the issue of education, and, the, the, yeah. and then the other development bank. So they should have actually given to every country an orientation on the issue of sectoral approach. Because once it worked in the Ministry of Education, this is a real story. The other ministry, health and other ministry, in particular health, did follow up on that, on that particular issue. So that became very, very important. But also with the understanding that, don't forget, we, we, we come from a, 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 car, a country that comes just from the war. Yeah. So this means if you miss to put the children in the school, see, the issue of quality is important. But access to education, for, b before the quality, you need to, to put the, the, the kid in the classroom. Oh, out of the street. Yes. Oh. Suppose Rwanda has not done that. This means Rwanda has not put more than a million children in the classroom. Rwanda has 2,000 cells. If you divide you know, a million by that, you will get 1,000 children in every cell. You cannot govern. You can have the, the, the whole thing of, of peace in Rwanda, the security that you can see when you visit Rwanda, it's related to the fact that they, they made that major investment. And the donor's money was really used in that orientation. Okay, thank you, Roman, so far. Finn, um, your comment. I, I've, I've been thinking quite a bit during the whole day. <clears throat> if you are not the best, are you then useless? Mm. What do you mean? If I'm not the best father in the world, am I then useful as a parent? Of course you are. Who is the best? I, th I think it's a fundamental misconception that if you are not absolutely first best in everything you do, then you are by implication useless. And there is a fundamental problem in our communication about foreign aid which is about that. I have, for my whole career, always been striving at getting better, at doing things better. And as a researcher, we are pointing, trying to point to results and trying to point to areas for improvement. But in our communication efforts, we are constantly confronted with the fact that if we are not the best, we're useless. And I think that it's incredibly important for all of us to reflect on that. No, I don't think donors are going to be perfect in coordination. I spent years of my life trying to coordinate 123 aid agencies running around the Ministry of Agriculture in Mozambique. It was hopeless. However, in spite of that, when I'm thinking about outcomes, when I arrived in Mozambique in 1980, there were 14 agronomists, Mozambicans. Today, there are 1,400. 
How, how did those 1,400 agronomists come about? W w where did they come from? Who, who funded their education? Uh, what, what happened? Well, I use Mozambique as a case because I've happened to work there for a major part of my life, but also because this was one of the countries that could not pay for that themselves. Mm -hmm. So what happened? A series of donors who, yes, did not coordinate. I've witnessed that sort of first floor because I was the program officer for the Mozambique Nordic Agricultural Program that fell apart, in part because of donor coordination problems. But in the process, the number of agronomists in Mozambique increased from 14 to 1,400. That, to me, is a result. It is. I mean, is this the best result? No, it could have been done better. But I, I mean, I, I really am trying to be conveying this because in the public debate about these issues, we tend to focus on that we could be better, which we should, but we should also not shy away from the results that are there. We heard today, aid has put pe uh, children in school. Then you can say, oh, some of them come out of school, don't read, absolutely. But I can assure you that a larger number of children are now exiting school, reading and writing, than 20 years ago. We heard that participation works. We heard that school feeding is very effective. We heard that social protection can actually work. It was pointed out that we have to be very careful in circumstances of when the domestic revenue generation capabilities is not there, then we, of course, we have to be really careful because we need, and that's maybe something that we should, from an aid perspective, be reflecting more on. Have we, as aid donors, aid actors, have we potentially built up systems that will be very hard to keep sustainable? That's clearly an issue. But we know that there has been an impact of all of this. We know that it pays to listen to others' mistakes. Well, that's why I kind of I like to be a researcher and kind of like to communicate, because I kind of think that this actually matters. I belong to those who actually very fundamentally regretted when the so-called development plans became out of fashion. You know, in the old days there were development plans and they were not always very good and sure, some of them reflected a central planning perspective. But they were documents of trying to explain something about what the aspirations of countries were. They were trying to identify what the building blocks of development should be. They became unfashionable. I personally believe but this is where I maybe differ a little bit, is that I personally believe that that's where we should put a lot of focus <clears throat> on trying to get these plans developed with a lot of what some people would call ownership. I'm a little bit hesitant about the ownership because typically I don't think I get title deed to somebody that some, somebody sort of gives me. So I, I tend to use domestic control, influence, planning documents, and so on, rather than the ownership. But I do know what it means. But I really think that that is where we should jointly put a lot more emphasis on coming up with mutually agreed documents that can sort of say what we want. I came to Vietnam in 2000, and I'll stop now. I came to Vietnam in 2000, I was a spouse. My wife had gotten a job. I had been in Vietnam for two weeks when I was phoned up by the UNDP. Could I kindly write the Vietnamese document for the MDGs? There wasn't a lot of ownership in that. No. So, of course, we see these things, but I would suggest that we must not be negligent of what has been achieved. We should constantly try to become better, but we must not let the latter get in the way we must not be, let the excellent be the enemy of the good, because there are good things actually happening. So I kind of... I think everyone would agree on that uh, in this room. Uh, I would like uh, 
to know from all of you what you think about this question, about the countries that newly uh, discovered natural resources and actually became rich countries. How do we make them spend more on the social sectors themselves and make people to pay taxes in their countries? In what way could aid be helping out that? What do you think, Charlotte? I think that it has a lot to do with uh, policy dialogue and I think that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Sweden, Sweden's development aid plan, mm. uh, Sweden's, as swe what Sweden regards itself to be, uh, in that policy uh, there is a lot of room for dialogue which must not go together with money, which can, in a humble but also f with a self-confidence way say that we also had a journey uh, from, from not a social protection system to the model we have today. Uh, let's share models. And I think one of the, the things that Sweden can do more of in supporting that dialogue is to more systematically work with the institutions that can really change, for instance, the tax authority in Sweden can you know, do the twinning aid, but not in this small, nice storytelling way, really strategic. I know, we have colleagues in Colombia who told me, maybe this is, maybe this is an, you know, a story that is a bit not mature yet, <laughs> but I was told that the Swedish tax authority is asked to not help to, be, to build the technicality around how to pay taxes, but, I'll, but, I'll, but to work together with Colombia to to advocate in Colombia for the reason why you should pay tax. Because they don't pay much. Exactly. Yeah. And th those kind of sharing experiences, I don't think we use that enough. If we do that in combination with systems, if we introduce, for instance, also maybe commercial systems, we have microfinance, we can have in, you know, micro insurance, so it, it mustn't be just the tax and all of that. So there's a lot of things we can do. Do you agree? Do you have any other ideas? <laughs> Yes. Well, of to course, it's our possibilities of direct influence are less because we would usually phase out support to those countries and then concentrate on, on poorer countries. You said uh, in Denmark you just leave when people we, we become... Use, uh, Vietnam is an example. Uh, we have had uh, a long uh, development cooperation with, with Vietnam. At a certain stage, we will decide that now this, this country will be able to do without our support and we can spend it better elsewhere in fragile states or, or other countries. But that doesn't mean that we leave the country entirely. Then we'll continue our commercial cooperation. And there may be um, CSR policies and, and other uh, for a for dialogue will be important, but of course we cannot influence things the same way as, as we can when we are major um, donor donors to, to a country. Mm -hmm. So what to do, Evan? Uh, for me, if, if I had support that country and in becoming richer rather than g living, I will work with that country to be a donor. How can you help yeah. now that I have helped you to, 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 lead, to reach this, this kind of level? Mm -hmm. How can you do that to help the other and, and in, the, in a more transparent way, uh, in a more accountable way? So you have these countries such as uh, you know, China, India, Brazil, mm. and you have some other countries mm. that... Nigeria. Mm. Yes, I, I've been dealing with them now in my capacity mm. as the head of the Academy of Science. I've seen actually they are supporting a lot mm. at programs. Mm. Uh, if you allow me, I can give you just an example because... Just an example, just an example. If you have to do a PhD in the US, it will, for four years, it will require you around $200,000. Mm -hmm. But uh, China, India, Brazil, Malaysia, they are giving to, to us already this year around 300 fellowships for PhD. So this means they pay everything, and we work with them on the return, and we pay the ticket to go to China, India, and come. So that they understand that. But that money, actually, if you look, is, is a lot of money. So, so in that, they become donor. But how do you put them in the international system? Mm. You know, so to make sure that, mm. that we all that aid is, 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 is accounted and is done properly. Charlotte, uh, yeah. No, but uh, can I just say that I, I think that's a very important role. I mean, Sw Sweden has also decided to uh, focus the bilateral aid to fewer countries. And one of the things that is being discussed is, should that be for poor people in poor countries? Well, what does that leave all the poor people in middle-income countries? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, one of the tools that Sweden is working with, maybe not 
as a response to that strategy, but, but at the same time does, is to how can we work with Turkey, South Korea, mm. uh, countries that have decided to be a donor, and they will, you know, they are big. <laughs> so how can we use our experiences with them to influence their ways of working, mm. being much more effective than Sweden, even though we're big, we're not biggest and all of that. So that's kind of an alternative strategy that might, might lead to much better results for people than just saying, well, they, they are there to do their work. So it's, it's really an opportunity. Mm. This, new di this new distribution of poverty, I mean, mm. meaning that most poor people don't live in poor countries. Um, do you agree, should we, should we change the focus? Should we focus on poor countries or on poor people? What do you think, Finn? That's a very big discussion. Mm -hmm. If I may just kick in in relation to what, just, what we just discussed. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an employee of the UN. I work as a citizen of the world. And I think it's very important <laughs> in these discussions that we try to the maximum extent possible to talk about them and us. Because that introduces a relationship which I fundamentally don't believe is the right one. We are all here in the same world, and we have together to try to figure out how the world is going to move forward. And then in that process, we need to keep in mind that there's not just one way that development can take place. There is a variety of paths that you can go through, and we as researchers and policymakers, we actually don't know exactly which way. So it's very important that we keep that in the back of our mind in, in the way in which we, we act. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leading an institution that has for years been said that we are focused on the poorest people mm -hmm. in the poorest countries. Now, so you, obviously your question is touching on something that's extremely important, right? Yeah, right. Because now we are seeing, in part as a consequence of aid, that quite a number of countries have now grown up and are no longer low income. So are they then no longer the poorest countries? Well, obviously that f leads to discussion, but I think it's important here to keep in mind that the fact that some countries have now moved just above a relatively artificial poverty line from having been low income to now being lower middle income. In many cases, the living conditions of the people have not really changed that much. But it does, of course, challenge mechanistic aid allocation formulas right. that we need to sort of rethink. But we should not forget for one second that a lot of the knowledge generation, a lot of the experiences and so on, they are, of course, relevant whether you are in a low income or in a low middle income. Now, I'll try and be very quick, but what we should keep in mind is that if you take the consequence of allocating aid by head, then you are going to get some aid allocation results that you might not have expected. And I think that needs to be put on the table. I don't think for one second that the world is going to live with most of the aid going to India and China. But that's actually going to be the implication of taking the consequence of what you're, you're sort of suggesting, namely that you count per person rather than by nation. So we need to be a little bit clear here and realistic and sort of, you know, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, yes. we, if, again, the Swedish example, there is a bilateral budget and a multilateral budget sure. and an EU cooperation. So you, you, are, you don't have to abandon poor people. Nope. Even if that you don't have a bilateral. Yeah. And the thing is, if you are thinking in that, how can we actually use the different formats mm -hmm. in a strategic way, you can do that. And, yeah. And, yeah. and I do think that that is something that governments and government agencies need to be smarter around, because we sometimes divide the channels and formats between yeah, sure. Our sure, sure. instead. And, but that's very important, because we're trying to find new ways not repeating lessons, uh, not repeating mistakes. One of the things that we need to do is to be smarter on the strategic, holistic portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. 
there is opportunities that we still have to explore. Roman. So, uh, Okay. I, I completely agree with that. I just wanted, I, I was actually heading in that direction. <laughs> well, always I was, no, no, all was I was trying to communicate was just that if we are talking about mm. the aid allocation formula and we are going to change that to a by head mm. poor person, then we are going to get some implications of that, which mm. I don't think would be acceptable. But mm. you're absolutely spot on in terms of the implications of this. Mm. Roman mm. And, as and then Tove. Also as an employee of the UN. <coughs> and, uh, <laughs> If you look at all these countries that have moved actually up, you look at their science and technology and education over the last three, four decades. There have been a lot of investment. The aid actually went into that. If you look at South Korea, how the US invested in that. So you realize actually science technology is a key in education. So there are more than 81 countries let's say 90 countries that are lagging behind in science and technology. If you look at the, the 2010 UNESCO science report, for these countries, they have, they have less than 0.1% of the scientific output, journals and, and other intellectual mm. property, etc. So, so, so the aid organization or the aid should be able to focus on those because education and then the, the holistic part, which is science and technology, should be taken into account. Uh, as uh, I know SIDA uh, does that, but we should come up with a major orientation because all the issues related to sustainable development as developed in Rio, and we are going towards a, a post-2015. What are we going to do with the, the global city, the, the one, the poor, the one that really needs the, the basic science? Are we going to formulate a, a, a science for all? like we did for Education for All. I've been trying to advocate a, a, a global science for all initiative so that actually people move from that the reading and writing and move for more for a, a basic a, a, a science knowledge. If you take the mother who's delivering a child now, who's taking care of the child who's, a, who's a below five years old, that mother needs some, some, need, some basic science. Understanding that feeding the kid, breastfeeding, is a scientific endeavor, and that will make a huge the issue of hygiene. Hygiene is very, very important. So, 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 so the basic, the basic science, is such important as it is in just big science and, and other and education and health. So speaks a former minister of <laughs> science. <laughs> but I, I agree with you, Tove. Yeah, well, just one remark on, on how to prioritize bilateral aid. This, yeah. this is what we're talking about. I think we, we, we need to reckon that we are, we are small donors and we need to be a bit humble about what we can do with our funds. Uh, and one of the criteria that we have is that we need to be able to, to uh, work with governments on the overall priorities. And if we're talking about governments who do not give priority to equality, to actually redistribution of uh, resources, then it's, it will be a very tall order for us to convince India, Nigeria, whatever, uh, to change these priorities. And, and the best we would be able to do was to run around in, in poverty pockets and, and do projects. Uh, and this is not what we want to do. We want to, to, uh, to support systems and build up capacities, and we want to do something which is sustainable. So, so I think it's just, just from recognizing that this is really out of our uh, zone of influence, we have decided to work with the countries where we have a chance of, of having a dialogue. Uh, so we would rather shift, or oh, this is actually what we do in Denmark, we shift into uh, fragile states when we move out of, of better off countries, when we're phasing out support to, to Vietnam, for instance, it's in order to, uh, to uh, build up in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, um, to yeah. have some comments and uh, questions from the floor. Um, where are the microphones? We have two people here. And... Uh, are our experts still, are you awake? Are you here? Good. I also want to say that there are actually a couple of hundred people following us on, in real time on the web right now. So it's, it's very nice. So while we are sitting here, people are sitting in Washington, Afghanistan and London, sort of. I'm following this. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, two questions. Roman, um, could you say, please, um, Rwanda followed a very specific path with respect to science and technology 
uh, and didn't just go along the line of focusing on primary education. How was that decision made and what implications does it have? And then the second really is to anyone, anyone on the panel who wants to take, take it up. Surely the thing with the, uh, the, the uh, large absolute number of very poor people in middle income countries, surely that opens up a new area for policy dialogue mm -hmm. uh, as well. So I, I wonder if what you're uh, doing in that regard. Do, Thank do you. you write this down? And we have another question. Um, where did I see the other mic? There. You have someone there too. So we start with you and then... Oh, wait, we start with this gentleman and then you, okay? You have to weigh very high. Oh, there I am also. Oh. oh, sorry, you didn't have a mic. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Bjarne Garden. I represent Norad Oslo. Greetings from Oslo to the panelists and the, the Norwegian audience. Aid. Norwegian Aid. Um, I observe that we have, for the main part, not always uh, today, uh, but for the main part, um, we have moved within the traditional aid paradigm very much. And there are examples now of changes going on. Some have been mentioned, but I would like to draw the attention to one or two such examples and then check the appetite with the panelists for that sort of interventions. Um, and one example is because we sometimes, aid has been associated with giving, sort of supporting service delivery, um, and not to a very large extent addressing the structures or the structural problems behind um, the lack of development. So for instance, on HIV AIDS, there have been quite successful attempts and results made in making um, uh, antiretroviral medicines much cheaper so that much mm. more people can ac assess them. And one would think that the impact of such price reductions would be much bigger than having some uh, social workers in, in small communities because then, and that would also not be only limited to country, uh, even people beyond uh, borders would Mm -hmm. uh, uh, have a gains from that. And another one is uh, a very recent UN initiative uh, on uh, introducing and through public-private partnership obtaining very much cheaper medicines, critical medicines for maternal health uh, mm -hmm. connected to birth. And one should think that would also have a much bigger impact than all sorts of social programs within countries maybe. But I would like to check that direction and the appetite for that with the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have one more comment question and then we'll answer to see where, where you are at this. Uh, uh, my question is very short. Once more, uh, Professor Francis Matamalio from the Nordic Africa Institute and Tanzanian. Uh, my question is uh, a directed to all of you. We know that one of the challenges we face is that some of these countries we are trying to assist don't even have the capacity to, capacity to absorb aid. And that usually leads to a situation where a poorer country gets less aid than a relatively more advanced country. I wonder whether you have thought about that and whether you have a solution for that also. Thank you. Okay, where do we start? Who wants to start? Shalom. Well, I, uh, yes, uh, I can can pick one question. Give it a go. First of all, the policy dialogue, the, the shift, uh, poor people, we, there's uh, a chance if, if uh, the post-MDG process chooses to take the chance to address this. Because what's being discussed now is that the post-MDG targets should still be about poverty reduction, but universal. Which means that, that the people we talk about live in countries that are absolutely in the game, not outside the game. And if, if, the, if the UN system and, and us being UN uh, take the chance of really ad understanding this shift and how to create a policy dialogue that is not bilateral, because as we said, I mean, yes, we want to believe that we can influence, but obviously we need other systems than, than the bilateral system. And I think there is a possibility 
uh, within the, that process to find ways and to realize that it is about equality and policy changes, not, not only about money. And what is being addressed in that process as we speak is that if the MDGs were about development aid, this is not about ODA any longer. This is about other financial flow, other actors and all of that. So there is an opportunity, but we really need to make sure that the right actors are engaging and invited to engage in that. Uh, and I want to see the glass as half full in that sense. Appetite for, for tackling root causes more systematically or, yes, uh, trying to find different ways of doing that. One, one example that we have currently is that we're working with together with Gates Foundation and a guarantee tool that SEED has got to influence so that uh, uh, the producer of something <laughs> that is too expensive can be cheaper over for some years thanks to a guarantee which is a loss protection tool. And we also have clients that are willing to buy enough to make sure that that pilot for three years will be sustainable. So we're trying to tackle the price situation, but for some years with a combination of tools. We love to see ourselves doing more of that. Uh, but you hear I'm talking about different actors than okay. just the de development actor. Tuva? Yeah. Like, like in Sweden, we're experimenting also with different approaches. Um, well, considering that there are so many other uh, key actors now, we're linking up with, with some of the new uh, South donors, such as South Korea, for instance, working with them on, on climate uh, change support to other countries. We are, we are uh, trying to look into possibilities of, of synergies between our development cooperation and our commercial cooperation. How can we bring in private companies, for instance, in health, who can do some of the things uh, that, that, that we are unable to do as a, as a donor. Um, for instance, uh, developing drugs which are relevant to a particular target group, etc., etc. We're looking at, at, at such possibilities um, because, as, as it's been said, uh, the world is changing and we cannot confine ourselves to look only at, at the traditional uh, aid structure. Then, then there was a question about uh, capacities and the importance yeah. of capacity when, when we, uh, we work in a country. And it's, it's quite apparent, I don't know if you phrased it that way, but it takes capacity to build capacity. Yes. Uh, it, it requires uh, also from, from, from a poor and maybe a fragile country, a lot of, of, uh, of capacity to deal with donors in a proper way. And, and we need to, uh, to formulate strategies and, and, uh, and work in, in a way that considers the difficulty of a country, for instance, of coordinating. If they have very poor, poor capacity, we can easily undermine whatever little capacity they have if we just uh, move in the way that we would have done in a traditional um, cooperation country. So, so uh, targeting our strategies and the way that we're working to the countries, uh, and as I said, we, we have now embarked upon uh, work with fragile countries in, 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 in quite a large scale, and that gives us some completely new challenges to, to the way that we uh, we've used to work. Finn? The challenge of many poor people in middle-income countries is a challenge for all of us. From the point of view of uh, the perspective of the institution I work for, you and you wider as an international think tank in development. I mean, this is obviously a challenge, but it's also part of the rationale for our existence is that we are creating and we are sharing knowledge. And we are hoping that we are capable of feeding that into this process in such a way <coughs> that that knowledge influences what's going on in the north, in the south, across east and west. So in that sense, what you're saying is that in many ways we want to try to contribute exactly in those circumstances, generating that knowledge which we believe is absolutely key. Let me say in relation to appetite, I personally believe that aid should have a lot of appetite whenever there is a good public reason for doing it. Whenever the private sector is not going to do it, there is an a priori rationale for aid to at least be thinking about it. It doesn't mean that aid should do it, but there is a reason to think about it. But part of what is changing in the world is, and that's where, fortunately, 
aid donors are paying more attention is, is that they also have to see themselves as very catalytic vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, because the balance has to gradually shift. More and more should be done by the private sector. And Earth aid helps put in place the contact, the framework, within which private agents are going to see it in their interest to do things. And that's exactly why aid is so imp incredibly important in a number of these contexts that we are talking about, including the fragile states. Did you want to comment short so we can let yeah, in? The, the, the point he made, um, uh, aid is an investment. So we all know that mm. for long-term economic growth, capital, and labor is not enough. You need to generate knowledge. So if this new investment coming into a country help to generate knowledge, to build the, the capacity, that's why we came up with the orientation measure on science and technology. If some of this investment goes into knowledge, in creating knowledge for long term, this has a huge impact. If one, one day Rwanda wants to graduate, or Burundi, or Benin wants to graduate from from, from, from the study they are now, is the investment in science. So if some of this aid could be focused on that, because it will, for, for many years, produce. And that's where education is a key, is yes. central. Thank you. OK, I want to um, first turn on, and then you can have a comment. And then one, two, three. That's about it. Please. OK. Thank you very much. And I have a couple of comments and maybe one question. A um, couple of comments. Short, in short. Yes, amount. very yes. briefly. Um, it's, I think we all are in the similar situation as I have been uh, when in the performance appraisal, I was asked, what is your long-term aim? I work in a center for international development. I said, in the, my long-term aim is that my job doesn't exist. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think we are in, we would like to see a world that doesn't need aid. And it's very difficult to be part of that. And I think we must be the only um, marketing or sales people who want to sell things which we don't want to have in the future. Uh, that I think has its own incentive issues. But also, as we work on these kind of things, we know that um, for example, whether it is poverty, number of poor people, or development outcomes, they don't decline linearly. If that is the case, then things would be different. But we know that it's always that the last mile gets steeper and steeper. So it's kind of asymptotic, or whatever is the mathematical word. So we know that also. So as more and more people or more and more countries graduate you know, above a certain level, the things that we want to achieve out of 750 million people, we said that about the water and sanitation, water, you know, access to water, maybe it's much easier to reach the first 375 million rather than the next 375 million. I think we know that. So there is, I think, always that kind of an issue. So that is one set of things in terms of how do we, in, in that kind of a context, think about aid or development as something which we would really, if we are really effective, then maybe in 20 years, 30 years, there should be no <laughs> discussion on aid, right? Okay. Um, and second point, and I will be very brief. I think, again, um, there ha we all recognize that governance and institutions are very important, and corruption comes up in public opinion surveys about aid, for example, the DFID, the survey. Uh, corruption, you know, when taxpayers, citizens talk about aid, almost the first word that they comes, you know, do you think aid is important? Everybody says, yes, it is important. And then very second word they say, but most of the recipient governments are corrupt. So corruption, I think, issue is a very important one. But at the same time, we really don't know how to deal with that because we have to be very careful. Otherwise, we may fall into the moral imperialism or in the new way of measuring aid and effectiveness, maybe we can coin a new term that is the efficiency imperialism. So we are kind of always picking countries which are doing very well so I can, again, that creates some of the incentive problems. So thank you, please. We have so little time. I want to hear all of you. So please be brief. Hi, my name is Michelle. Um, Hi, I'm a research student. Oh, it's a question for the panel. I just want to know. You sort of basically touched on it, but do you, as agencies together, collectively um, lobby for touching on technology and science with the WTO about patents? We mentioned about HIV and antiretroviral drugs and science and technology, but because patents are being extended, what, have you looked at that? Because if you're going to grow science and technology in the developing world, where are they going to require development of those drugs? Do you use your agency 
collectively within the European Union to lobby against with the WTO? Okay, we'll see what, how, how far we'll get in five minutes and three more speakers. Yes. Oh, you don't have a microphone. So who has? So please start. Okay. Oh, and then you. Um, I, I, I can't retain my, myself to still come back to the data issue once. Um, I mean, I, I totally agree that we have lots of areas where we have collected a lot of data and where we don't actually use them. Um, but now, I mean, we're being asked for this conference to relate aid data to outcome data. And I mean, when you see things that like in, in, in the DAC data, um, the, the coverage of the sector wise um, data is until the mid 90s by about 30 percent. And then, un on, on, then until t uh, 2002, 60 percent. Um, and even like for 2010, even though you have the data for 2011, but in 2010, again, it's still low because probably not all the reporting has been done, which you don't see immediately because you already have newer data. So it, it becomes very, very difficult because then you get a trend up, like I showed it with the education data, and you, you have to make a whole lot of assumptions, for instance, to make sure that you're not just um, correlating a trend in reporting with a trend in, in enrollment rates, rather than a trend in actual aid with enrollment. And, and these kind of things are so tricky. So I'm actually not surprised, even within our research community, we are getting such contrasting uh, results in many mm -hmm. cases, because if you always have to make this and that assumptions, and of course the assumptions might be, <laughs> may personal, be different. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I mean, okay, that, yeah. that generates problems, right? <laughs> yes, please. Um, Abby? Um, you've been mentioning um, about multilateral agencies. Um, we, have, we have had two new multilateral agencies that I think are both are in health, Gavi, which is a um, vaccine initiative, and of, of course a global fund um, for um, malaria, AIDS, and, uh, and uh, TB. But um, so what sort of... Um, new multilateral aids uh, do you, um, sorry, governance agencies do you envision? And uh, are you just going to do through UN and World Bank? Um, or do we need to think about the architecture of um, multilateral agencies, uh, including the, um, including the um, Gates Foundation, um, which I believe actually is controlled by one person in some ways? And do we need to think about and a board that just, just does things in, like Global Fund or WHO, which would be a, a entire nation. Sorry, entire set of <laughs> nations. Well, okay. You said what you felt. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, the last comment question, and then we'll try to answer some of the questions and get some remarks because quarter past, we have to finish. Yeah. That's uh, four hello. more minutes. My name is Rosie Grenklo. I work at Plan Sweden. Um, I have actually two questions, maybe not possible, but. <laughs> I will we'll try see to what be short. Yeah. Um, the one is linked to what we talked about just recently on the private sector. I fully agree that we have to see that development aid requires, uh, development requires a number of different actors. But I also see that uh, when it comes to the private sector, we have to also be a little bit cautious. Uh, it's not like any actor, it's not like like um, a donor, um, a bilateral donor. They have also other uh, goals. So what do you see there? What are the things uh, we should think of? I think research is very much needed to understand what has been done so far with private sector involvement. Uh, we have seen in Sweden cases where it hasn't worked very well, I would say, maybe in Denmark too. Uh, so it would be interesting to hear what, uh, what the challenges you see and, and what can be uh, done to avoid mistakes, because of course there will always be things happening that we don't want. But uh, I think you will hold that. this one question, okay? okay? Now, can I get five more minutes on over time? Because there are some really interesting uh, remarks and questions here. Who wants to pick up and then short answers? Sorry. Yes, please, Tove. I think there was a question for me regarding uh, data. Uh, and lack of data, yeah, right. uh, that, that you have to make a lot of assumptions because it's missing. I, 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 w I want to be clear that I didn't say that research is not needed. Research is needed and better monitoring systems are needed. But I think that sometimes we should not have to wait to have a debate about our priorities until we have the full, full, full picture and all the, uh, the, uh, the details and the context of, of, of uh, everything. Sometimes we can actually, based on 
what you have produced already, have a, a, a fruitful discussion. And I think that the discussion today illustrates that we, we can, uh, if we just sit and wait until we have the perfect data, it's almost like Finn said, um, we're sitting and waiting for the perfect and, and, and until then we cannot really make any decisions, is already much better than, than what we have. And this is really what we wanted with the RECOM program when we started it together with Sweden. We wanted to have a synthesis of the existing knowledge, not necessarily uh, a lot of, of, uh, of new knowledge on this, but a synthesis on the existing knowledge which would make it apparent to us what have the, the, the experience so far been, when do we need to, uh, to have further attention, and are there areas where it comes out very clearly that we, we should be reluctant to, uh, to support that. And then, of course, further research can uh, put in some more nuances and even challenge some of these conclusions, but it's already much better than what we have. Thank you, Tove. Short, short answers. Uh, no, I don't think we lobby on science and technologies. Thank you. Thought-provoking. Uh, two, uh, multilateral system. Uh, we have some new examples that we think are working. We actually think they are quite effective, Gavi and so on. This is my personal view. I'm not deciding on this. It's the government, so please. I don't think that the solution for the future is to create more platforms. We have enough of them. Thank you. <laughs> Let's decide what we want. If UNDP's mandate is governance, for instance, let's hold that together and work within the system as shareholders to make it more effective. And that is hard work, but that's what we are here to do as a system. Thank you, uh, Roman. Short. And private sector, we need to do the mistakes. We need to learn about their driving forces. We are not always good either. So okay, Roman, short. Yeah, we live in a in a shared world, uh, the poor of the world, you cannot forget them because if you forget them, it may have an impact on sustainable development or the issues of climate and emissions and cutting the tools, the deforestation. So, so really, aid is there not only because that you just feel like it, it, it is a charity. No, because it is even for you, it is very important. Because you know, you want, you don't want these people to continue to, to cut the trees on the, in the tropics. We have a, a catastrophic uh, uh, consequences. So really investing in, 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 uh, in, in, in development and education, it's a priority even for the, developing, the developed world to help have a sustainable world and, and development. Thank you. Last word, Finn. I'm not sure if all of those questions were answered, but please bear with us. Well, when Amartya Sen came up with the acronym WIDER, the WIDER perspective 27 years ago, this was exactly to highlight that we do need to keep the WIDER development perspective in mind throughout. Aid is one, but only one, element of a complex development puzzle. We need to keep the WIDER perspective in mind throughout. The aid project for WIDER is an interesting area. It's one among 11 projects or programs. Another one is on learning to compete. It's on trying to understand what's happening in the private sector in Africa. Another one is about the interlinkages between growth, inequality, and poverty. So aid is for us one specific element which we are pursuing. And it's a very final comment. Yes, as researchers, of course, we always like more data and so on and so forth, but there is also a task in trying to weed out those results that are out there that actually don't stand on their feet when they are subjected to careful professional analysis. And that's part of what we are doing in Recom. Thank you.